Hello everyone, this is Michelle Cruz from CCLP, the Fantastic Cohort of 21. Veronica Garcia, Alicia Moore, and I have uh, prepared and will be presenting a case brief today on Lafayette versus Wallace State Community College. So let's start off with some basic facts of the case. So Washington State Community, uh, Community College will be referred to as WSCC from here on out. So WSCC hired Winnellan LaFure as a full-time professor of business and secretarial science. So new faculty are hired under a three-year probationary contract, which may not be renewed at the end of the year without cause. WSCC employed only for African-American full-time faculty, and this was out of a total of 92 full-time faculty. And since the year of 1975, WSCC had been under federal court order to actively recruit qualified African-American faculty. So after LaFure's first year, Joanne Hathcote, who was our supervisor, had made multiple racially derogatory statements regarding African-Americans that were witnessed by other employees. At the end of the first year of LaFure's contract, it wasn't renewed, and this was based on their facts that LaFure did not fulfill several job requirements and that she was not a team player. So at the end of the year, LaFure filed a suit under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. So the primary issue in this case is whether the plaintiff's contract was not renewed due to her race. So we came up with, with a couple different things. And so one, as part of the racial discrimination claim, the plaintiff asserted the disparagement treatment theory. And so this is a claim that an individual of a protected class is singled out and treated less favorably than others. And as part of a racial discrimination claim, there must be, uh, they, mu they actually must follow the, the, the following burdens of proof, is that the individual belonged to, belonged to a protective class, that they were actually qualified for the position, the contract was not renewed regardless of her qualifications, and that she was replaced by a person not from a protected class with equal or less qualifications. And finally note that the burden of proof is a standard for this case, and it's, it is, which is a preponderance of evidence. So this is kind of similar to what's used in campus student conduct hearings, meaning that the evidence provided is more likely true than not. The process in this case was actually a bench trial, meaning that the judge was a sole fact finder of the case. So ultimately, the court ruled that they, well, one, they acknowledged that the plaintiff was not a model employee and that race was a primary reason for not renewing the contract. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the court's ration, uh, rationale here. So regarding the, the discrimination complaint, the court's rationale was that the evidence provided met the standards required for a discrimination claim. That one, the plaintiff did demonstrate that she was part of a protective class. The second, that the plaintiff met the minimum requirements for the position. The third, that while the defenders offered other reasons for the plaintiff's dismissal, the reasons did not convince the court that they were substantial enough to justify non-renewal of her contract. And finally, the defendants hired someone who was not a member of a protected class with equal qualifications to replace the plaintiff. So our group kind of came up with some implications for community colleges, as community colleges, and we thought there were three. So the very first was job description. So the court found that the institution believed that the academic credentials must have been from an accredited institution. So WSCC should have noted that on the job announcement. And while accreditation status is usually a given with higher education, the court's decision may influence whether institutions should add this clarification to job announcements, job descriptions, contracts, or other documents associated with the hiring and employment of individuals when a cert certificate is required. Secondly, we agree that the court, we agree with the court that the reasons presented by WSCC were weak. However, this reiterates the need um, that when the legitimate situations warrant the dismissal of an employee, colleges and universities must clearly articulate how these reasons connect to the job description, written performance expectations, employee contract, and other official documents. And finally, in terms of roles, so the colleges and universities should be clear on the role each individual plays within the institution, clearly defining who is culpable in legal matters. Depending on state governing regulations, institutions may also wish to consider specialized insurance for senior leadership that may assist in potential litigation. And finally, our group came up with two remaining questions. So one was on the burden of proof. So while we understand the preponderance of evidence standard, is this typical in bench trials in which the preponderance of, uh, preponderance of evidence standard is used? And then finally, um, was, there really, was there a basis for a hostile work environment claim? So those are the questions that we actually came up with. 
And finally, we're going to include with other items to note um, here, and I know we're exceeding our five minute limit, so I'll make it fast. And so whether the primary issue in this case was whether race was a factor for non-renewal of the plaintiff's contract, the court also required to render findings um, that related to other potential remedies. So, so the, basically the court determined receipt of back pay and lost benefits were appropriate. The court did decline to reinstate the plaintiff to her position. The third was the court declined to pose injunctive relief, stating that the payment of back pay was enough to incent the institution to avoid future discriminatory actions. And finally, the court agreed that the institution must pay the plaintiff's attorney fees. So that concludes our presentation. Thank you for listening.